Sorry, Adam. Someone had to go first. Good morning, Tash. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let me just get myself organised. Right. Who's heard of True Classic? I'd like to see who knows which brands. Who's a True Classic customer? Simon, Steve's definitely a True Classic customer. I'll send out some discount codes, don't worry. We've got discount codes, haven't we? So, Adam, welcome. Please tell us a bit about who you are and what you do and tell us the amazing success of True Classic because I just want to set the context that some brands do things exceptionally well and they do things in a very clever way and True Classic is one of them and that's what Adam is going to be sharing with us today. Welcome. Thanks, Tash. Yeah, my name's Adam. I joined True Classic only about six months ago and seven months ago, I'd never heard of the company. I'm in similar shoes or was in very similar shoes to, to a lot of you guys. And the company's grown very quickly over the last two or three years. The kind of founding story was it was founded by three guys in the US in 2019 who saw a need to, they saw an opportunity essentially for men's fitted t-shirts. T-shirt, can you think of a more competitive commoditized category in the world to then take into direct consumer? Not really, but we decided to go into it. And uh, we felt that the current market in the US at the time was underserved for, uh, in terms of fit and in terms of feel. So the guys released a product that was really focused on helping men look and feel better. So it was a bit tighter in the arms, it was a bit tighter in the chest and a little bit looser in the stomach, which is a more general... Says a bit. lot about men, <laughs> to Pro be honest. <laughs> The product market fit has been surprisingly good. But that company launched in 2019, or the guys launched it in 2019. In 2020, it did about $15 million of revenue, just pure direct to consumer. In 21, it was about $90 million. And last year, we did about $150 million of revenue. Primarily, that's because it's just a product that's fitted really well. But equally, just the approach of the company has been very data-driven, very focused. And it's something I'll talk a bit more about today. Great. So should we go straight into the ad spend and the staggering amount of money you guys manage and how you manage that? Can you share with everyone a bit of your media spend and how you trade that? Yeah, so the, co the company is, one thing to be aware of is the company was bootstrapped and is a profitable company. So it hasn't taken loads of venture capital money and then driven a very high growth level that then is difficult to sustain. So it's always tried to do things, I guess, theoretically the right way. The way we've scaled spend has been very incremental and getting bigger and bigger over time. But the philosophy has always been break even on first order and then let your repeat customers generate your profit. So we have a very clear idea of how much profit all the way down through all, all the way down to your gross margin, but also the variable costs around how much it costs to, to generate your creative, to do a return, to facilitate customer services issues. We have a very clear idea of that for a new customer. And then that is the level we're willing to invest in CAC. And then we will scale spend regardless of channel as much as humanly possible to hit that level. But we'll also think a lot about incrementality. There are some, some campaigns and some channels will have a very good ROAS or very low CPA, but they might not be the most incremental channels. And then some will have a horrible CPA or ROAS because from a last click point of view, but will generate a ton of incrementality. Um, and we spend a lot of time thinking about how to measure measure success. We spend deep into the six figures a day. This is so I work on the international business. That's about a third of the business. We haven't got to that quickly. That's happened over over the last well, relatively over the last three years. And I think one of the things we spend a lot of time on it, as I said, is understanding performance by channel and how we can optimize CAC ROAS on a day by day basis. And we'll use tools like Triple Whale, like North Beam, we'll use post purchase survey to really try and understand incrementality and then work out how much we can scale spend on a day to day basis. So in terms of the day trade, so back in 2017, quite a few brands used to do operate through day trading, looking at ad spend and adjust, making adjustments on half hour, 15 minute intervals. What's interesting about you guys is you still do that and lots of brands don't do that any longer. But it works, right? Yeah, why is that? It's a good question. We are firm believers in things like ASC on Facebook or on Meta. We're firm believers in Pmax. Like we, we don't think media buying needs to be super complex and manual. But we're also firm believers that we the market and the world and our customers are changing on a day by day basis. And we don't know what day is going to drive a really good CPRO. So we're going to look on a day when you're spending that amount of money, you're going to look early and see how you've performed in the morning and see whether you can make tweaks. And there are certain tweaks that if you make them too much of a tweak, you're going to ruin your performance for the rest of the day. But there are, you can invest into campaigns or pull back from certain campaigns if you don't see the results you want. And then we'll review yeah, midday and then at the end of every day to define the following day's budget. Previous place I've worked at, you've looked at budgets at a monthly and a 
day, not never a daily, but a weekly level. We will look every six to eight hours because of the volume of spend going in, but not to break the campaign, spend a lot more or spend a lot less. It's a very involved process. We don't have an enormous in-house team, but we have some very good agency partners and we leverage a lot of technology and a lot of tools to try and optimize that in the best way possible. We don't always get it right for sure, but that's our approach. So before we come on to the technology and tools, which is super fascinating, can you talk about, you said to me, most big companies want big solutions. And one of the ways True Classic has achieved what it's done is by looking for small incremental solutions versus one big one. Yeah, so if I take a bit more of a step back and think about what has grown the business, it's not just Metaspend. So we've, we launched as a US-based direct-to-consumer t-shirt business. Like, pretty pretty simple, that was our niche, it worked well. So we broadened out, we were like, we're solving a problem from a t-shirt's perspective, but we think there's a problem that we can solve across broader parts of menswear, whether it's shirts, chinos, jackets, outerwear, activewear, about getting a really great fit, like a great feel on the product, and affordable rather than a kind of eye-gouging price. So we broadened out into wider menswear, so there's category expansion there. We then thought about, okay, this problem isn't just specific to the US, like we have the, the whole world, there's a lot of men out there, it's a pretty large addressable market. So we launched International. And the way we launched that business was, as you're saying, relatively incremental. We, we said, we don't know whether this is going to work or not. We partnered with an organization called Globally that allow you to switch on international shipping to 190 countries. You've got to do a little bit of tech work, but you can do that from your existing infrastructure. So we fulfill all of our orders out of our fulfillment center in North America, which is something I'm trying to change. And switching that on generated just a ton of revenue when we put Meta out there as well, because you can switch on your Meta ads across the world very easily. So we didn't know that was going to be big. That was really big. And now we have a good sense of all the different countries we want to go to. And then additionally, we want to go to, we're moving across channels. So we're, we started as a direct consumer brand, but we're not, we want to be where our customers are. Like our customers are shopping. You've got like in the US, a third of apparel is online but two-thirds is offline at least so there's a ton of opportunity in offline we've opened five owned retail stores we sell on amazon in marketplace because customers are there we'll look at wholesale options we have an app with Tapcart. we we're in social stores we do like a bunch of things that mean that we are where our customers are rather than always trying to pay what is an expensive premium to drive them to our website but all of those things have been incremental as we've built out then when we think about just optimizing the website because most people are going to be thinking about direct to consumer we just test so much it blows my mind because it, it honestly it isn't me i'm watching it happen on slack with all of my colleagues who are in la but the vol we're running kind of five to ten a b tests every single week we've got so many apps we'll plug in we'll see if it works if it works great it might drive one percent incremental revenue or three percent incremental conversion rate or two percent incremental revenue per session and we'll take those wins and then you roll it out and we just add and add and add and over time some of the changes have been very really impressive we've grown from an aov when the company launched of like forty dollars in the us it's now over a hundred dollars and that's in three years just by layering on and layering on our conversion rate that you go on the website it's not the prettiest website you're ever going to see. I'm really honest. I was like, how is this brand doing this volume? And then I got in and you see the conversion rate changes over time. And you're like, wow, this is, this is nuts. And just this approach to like, you're never, ever done. You're never perfect. So stop worrying about trying to be perfect and just trying to get incrementally better every day is something that the company seems to be pretty good at and has driven a lot of success from. So let's talk through some of those apps, because when I first spoke to you, we have a set of apps we work with. And if you've worked with us, you'll hear us saying, oh, this is that and do and try this and do that. And it's sometimes frustrating because brands won't, they agonize over it. And you're like, it's just a Shopify app. Just plug it in and turn it on and see what happens, which is what you guys do. But let's run through. You mentioned Tapcart. Uh, I'm a big fan of Tapcart. Any Shopify store can be turned into an app. You can send unlimited notifications. They're not even one of our partners, but I'm still a big fan. Can you just share what's, what Tapcart has done for True Classic? Yeah, Tapcart has become a material revenue driver for us. As you said, being on Shopify opens you up to being able to plug into a ton of other things. Of course, there's some integration and stuff to switch on, but it's been helpful for us. Tapcart has a conversion rate of 50% higher than, it, than we have on our website. We have a, about a 10% higher AOV on Tapcart. So you've got 70, 74, 75% higher 
revenue per session on tap cart session versus a website or a mobile app session. So that's like really material. So we then have to kind of work out how do we drive customers to tap cart to convert. And you've got some like selection bias in there that if someone's going to download our app, they're probably going to have converted, et cetera, better. But we believe that that's an important place to be. And there's a subset of our customers where we can drive more notifications to them, better connections with them. We have a, a community that's launching fairly soon, and that's going to be pretty fundamentally linked in with the app. So there's, yeah, it's been, it's been very helpful and very good for us. And how do you find the notifications element of TapCart? Because that's one of their USPs, isn't it? It's, just, it's always a question of how you're going to get to these people when they're so distracted. And this is through an app notification on a phone. Yeah, so we don't, I can't speak to it in too much detail, but what I can say is we don't have a dedicated person on TapCart. We don't have a dedicated team on TapCart. We have TapCart and then our existing kind of retention email SMS team just has that as another channel they work on. And our merchandising team just think about TapCart as very similar to the website. It needs to be managed very slightly different, but it hasn't required a ton of additional OPEX operating resource. There's going to be a small amount of distraction in that space versus anything else but it, versus those conversion lifts that I talked about it seems like a very worthwhile investment and some of the other apps that you've got in the store that are working well video wise rebuy for instance yeah we use we use a ton of different things to be honest so video wise we launched relatively recently video wise is like Instagram reels but on your PDP on your product page and we found that was a great way of just communicating some of our messages and also aligning with a lot of the ads customers would see on a social platform and then they saw that again on the PDP and it made that connection for them so that's driven yet yeah, incremental conversion and revenue and frankly like if an it's going to be different for every single brand. So my suggestion is always, or the way we think about it is we will try stuff. Just because it didn't work for someone else doesn't mean it won't work for us. So we'll try stuff and if it works and we'll A-B test it, great, we'll keep it. And then we'll compare and contrast to other options. So anything we've got on the site right now is the best thing for us out there. So yeah, rebuy we use and that's like a 3% increase in revenue for us to, to plug that in and just suggest alternative or additional su supplementing products on the PDP. So that's been very impactful. We, and core to it is triple well as your dashboard. Yeah, we, other things that we've seen in the on the US site, for example, there's two like interesting things. One is after, and then I'll talk about triple, but one is after purchase upsells, we've seen being quite successful. We use something called after sell. And essentially after you complete your purchase, it then says, hey, get 50% off this product if you buy it now. So you can sell them into a product that they literally weren't buying before and you can attach it into the existing order with no additional cost and you know exactly what the margin of that sale is. And that's driven a load of incremental revenue. And then we have a very interesting cashback app we use in the US that doesn't work outside the US. But this blew my mind when I learned about it and has been quite impactful to our P&L because we would do, like a lot of brands, 10% off or 20% off your first order. Um, and that's just money that comes, once people use that code, that's just money that comes straight off the top of the P&L. When you do a cashback app, you can say, hey, let's get 20% cashback. So when you complete your order, you can you then get an interface where you can select, okay, I can get 20% back on a digital card, or I can give you like 30% on a gift card, or you might just not process anything. And turns out like 60% of people don't process anything. So if you think of that 20% discount you're giving to everyone normally, you have 60% of people not engaging with that because they're less price sensitive. So you're letting people self-select into certain price sensitivities. So 60% don't do anything, so you save all that money. You've then got maybe 20% go to gift card because you can put that at a higher level because some people are going to use it, some people are not, but it's coming back to the store and that's returning purchase. And then only 10% were taking away the digital gift card at the end of the day where they could then go and spend it elsewhere. And I was like, wow, I, this is 100% happened to me when I bought Virgin Media and they've offered me like 100 pounds free cash back. And I'm like, great. And then it comes on a digital card and I might use it, I might not. That That's just the reality. And that has, that's been really impactful because we've got to offer more money back to customers, which is driven conversion and acquisition, and actually say and take less off the bottom line. So that app's called Fondue. I don't think it's available outside the US, but that's been like really interesting. But then you've got all of these things and at a high level, you're then saying like, how do we actually monitor whether these things are doing well? So you've got, we do a load of A-B tests, but we use Triple to really understand how everything is working together. And Triple Well is essentially just like an app that plums into your Meta, your Google, your Shopify, your Clavio, you're just like absolutely everything. It does, it's got some attribution in there so it can tell you where your sales are coming from, what the CPA and ROAS is, but you can just see it all in one place real time. So I'll get up 
and open my triple app and scroll through. And I can see how sales are trending versus the day before. I can see what channels are driving that. I can see where our CPA is looking good or looking soft. And then we can make corrective decisions like straight away versus a world where you're like logging on and you're like downloading an Excel from Shopify, then you're downloading an Excel from platform here and a platform there and then comparing and contrasting. And then six hours later, you might have an insight, but it's no longer real time. So I'd say tri triple is a tool that we all use and it is super useful. Who has Triple Well on their store in here, just so I know? I always say about Triple, it's incredibly clever and the guys who run it are incredibly clever and it's all very technical. However, the genius of it is actually the dashboard, which is what you're talking about. The view that allows, is a real-time view of all channels that then allows you to take decisions and see where revenue gaps are. And that's how you're using, isn't it? Using it. Yeah, exactly, on a real-time basis to compare and contrast across channels. And you can drill in and dive in and no, no tool is, is perfect. And there's no, to your point about, earlier about, and I used to work at Unilever, a consumer goods company who you'd often be looking for, what are the big bets we're making to like turn the corner, move the dial, and then you'd really focus on two or three big bets. And I don't find that applies very well in direct to consumer. I find taking like lots and lots of little guesses and see what works and then leaning into them works, works really well. And triple is one of those things where it's way better than what we had before and it's gonna get even better. And we use that to just understand how we're performing on a yeah, day by day, week by week basis. And just finally, the last question for you is about the fact you do use the tap, the tech that other people have built. So you're not trying to build your own things. You're taking the best of what's out there and using that. We sometimes see brands get themselves in twists of should they build their own attribution suits? Should they build their own thing? What's your view on that? I can tell you how True Classic do it. It's, I think it's different for every brand and every organization is going to think about it in a different way. But for us, we don't. We've got a team of sub 50 people and we don't really want to grow that. We'll like hire leaders who can lead a team and then manage manage other partners and agencies. But generally, if we see a problem or an opportunity in the business, we will say, how do we solve that with technology? If we can't solve it with technology, how do we solve it with an agency? If we can't find an agency, maybe it's a freelancer. And the very last resort is hire someone. And that's not because people aren't, aren't great, but it's just that it's complicated hiring people and it can take months and the problem you were solving when you're changing quickly can change and you've hired someone who's great at this but maybe they're not great at that and then you have a different kind of internal challenge so what we try and do is hire fairly senior leaders who can then manage and bring on board different tools or yeah you're going to talk about ai look into ai look into a whole load of things in that world and not have to bring out a load of people a tangible example so like two real world examples so as i said i do the international business it's just me. It's a third of the business. But we work with Globally, who enable us to, to deliver all over the world. And yeah, there's a lot of work going on, but fundamentally, they've made that super easy. In the past, I've had teams of five, 10 people to launch a single international market. We've been able to do it with just me and a bit of tech. If I think about launching retail, we have five owned retail stores in the US. They were launched with a partner called Leap, who take the leases, they do the bill, they do the fit out, they definitely take a margin, but they enabled us to get in and learn about retail, decide if that's something we want to do, go through the that painful stuff with a partner that's done it 100 times before, rather than ourselves. Amazing, Adam. Thank you so much. So you're going to hang around for a bit. So Adam's going to be here. If people want to ask him questions, drill down on any more of those apps, then Adam's going to be here. But thank you so much, Adam. Thanks very much. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.